myself. Uh, my name is Tom Mavrudis, and I've um, run data programs for the last, uh, I'm going to say, 12 years for um, three of the largest banks, uh, one U.S. bank and, and, three, and two international banks. So, um, you know, I've been around the block. Uh, you know, I've seen things work, and I've seen things uh, that don't work, and, um, and I've been part of things that work, and been part of things that don't work, but learning from each experience. And I, you know, I think that um, our discussion today will be a culmination of, of, of some of those experiences. And uh, I look forward to the Q&A. As uh, Jason had mentioned, I'm going to take about 30 minutes to go through. Uh, I don't have a slide, so apologies. Uh, but to go through this discussion, and then I'll leave some, I'll leave ample time for um, uh, our uh, Q&A at, at the end. Um, one other thing, I'm going to have to turn my video off. We have a storm here, so uh, if I don't turn the video off, what's going to happen is my audio will be somewhat muffled. So I'm going to turn the video off, but here's my picture, uh, and then I'll turn it back on for the Q&A, and hopefully it works. Um, so let me do that now. Okay, so can everybody hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, good, good. So we're gonna talk about transforming data quality using artificial intelligence and machine learning, and also some other routines and techniques that, that we've developed to augment that along the way. So, and I kind of call it DQ disruption. So let's think about what traditional data quality is. You typically identify some data stewards. You discover and validate candidate CDEs. You profile your data. You write and test uh, uh, rules and you refine your CDE list based on the profile, then you write more rules. You promote these rules through the environment, through the you know, SDLC, through different environments, into production, you go live, you refine rules, and that's usually a loop uh, that happens and you keep on refining rules because typically your first set of rules, you really didn't understand your data 100% and those initial set of rules might yield it some results that you thought were anomalous, but not so, but maybe not anomalous. So you go through this loop. And typically, depending on the C on number of CDEs and rules and dimensions and resources, it takes three to six months and it could e take even more. Um, and that's project by project. So this is what I think you're familiar with, right? And what I'm saying is that we're going to replace the majority of this with uh, a new way of thinking. So you also have to take into account your policy. So what does your policy say about data quality? Um, it, does it say that you're required to do data quality at the origination layer and also at the consumption layer? Because we typically do data quality at the consumption layer because as we know, um, most our, our, our initial initiatives are usually regulatory based and we do it at the risk and the HR and the compliance layers but we don't necessarily do it at the, at the uh, origination layer. But it, it all depends on what your policy says around DQ. Um, and I'm going to say that maybe your formal DQ measurement program is run against maybe 1% of your tier one critical data. Again, because it's very expensive. You know, we have that long lead time. We have, you know, significant amount of resources to code and to test and to go through this iterative process. Um, and you might be performing targeted data discovery across a, a large cross-section of data for, let's say, PII identification or other data classification efforts, but it's not what I'm, it's not really what I'm talking about now. I'm talking about traditional data quality and rules and, you know, abnormal, identifying anomalous behavior and that whole process. So how do we perform data quality at scale in a rapid time frame using limited resources that yields results and the results are the outcome of measurement, right? And we identify data that's incomplete, not accurate, and is not valid. So the exception to my new DQ approach is comprehensiveness. And let me explain why. So comprehensiveness is, you know, typical DQ dimension and comprehensiveness, the way I define comprehensiveness is at a business level. So not are all the did not all the did all the records from the origination reach the target right or the consumption layer i i look at it more from a business i mean those are nice and those are really it controls right i look at it from a business 
uh, from a business dimension layer? Did all of the payments that were supposed to go from the payment system, did they reach, let's say, the transaction monitoring system or the sanction screening system, et cetera? So I look at it at comprehensiveness from a business perspective because you might have some filters in there. So, um, so that, that's kind of the way I look at it. So that's outside of the scope of this because I, I haven't figured out a way to do that with this new approach, but, um, but that's something that we still are doing at the business layer. Now, if you're only doing it at the IT layer, then the, you know, those processes still yield um, you know, results, right? Do, you know, checksums and that kind of stuff. Um, so the phase one approach that we took is implementing a DQ profiling capability in all systems that feed critical business functions at source. And source can be defined as original source or an aggregation point. Um, so let me give you an example. So we all, always think of, we have to go back to the originating source, but it's okay to measure data. A source can be defined as an aggregation point, not, not a warehouse, but let's say you move your um, loan data from your origination or your authoritative data so source at the origination layer at the, with, at the application that it gets originated and you move that data set in total to another place. Let's say it's your lake and you move it into your staging area, your you know, TS, TSZ layer, your, your, let's just call it the staging area. And you have the proper controls in place to guarantee the delivery and the integrity of that data then I still, I believe that that should be considered a uh, source data. So you can do DQ at source. You don't necessarily have to have the original, original source. You have to have the original source data. That's the distinction. So that's a little nuance that I wanted to communicate here. Um, and again, you have to have the proper controls in place. So depending on the profiling tool, the visualization is usually complicated and not consumable for the average data steward, right? So you look at the output of, let's say, I'm not going to name them, but you know who the culprits are, the, the uh, traditional data quality tools that do data profiling. Uh, you know, they have some pie charts and that kind of stuff, but it's usually, you know, unconsumable data. And then when you get to the Excel layer, you really can't make sense out of it, right? And also, if you have multiple data quality tools, the visualization layer looks, looks different for each tool. So you want to normalize that. So you want to build a visualization layer. And before you do that, you need to build a common meta model that comprehends all of the DQ profiling output, everything that you want from DQ profiling across all the tools. And, and then you build that visualization layer. So I kind of break the visualization layer down into three different areas, completeness, right? So are these attributes complete? And you look at the, uh, the, the metrics, the completion metrics. So attribute by attribute. Um, you know, whatever they are, 95% completeness, 0% completeness, whatever. And, you know, the, the, these are typical outputs of a data profiling tool, but you want to visualize them in a way where the user can sort them. They can look at them in descending order. You know, they could maybe drill down um, on each at attribute. And then you can also look at the uh, completeness of the actual file itself. And then you could look at historical data. Um, the, next, the, the next piece is the pattern analysis. So I call this um, the validity piece. So these tools will typically show you patterns, right? And you want to sort those patterns. You want to try, you, you, by running this over and over again, you kind, you kind of want to build this control group of patterns. So for example, if you have an al alphanumeric field and it's XX dash XX dash, you know, XXXX uh, as an example, um, and 95% of your patterns conform to that, you're going to look at the other 5% as fairly anomalous behavior. And, 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 that's, and that's going to allow you to drill down right away and say, hey, wait a minute, what, this doesn't look quite right. And you, will also, you also might see special characters in that, um, in that pattern as well. And if you know that your data shouldn't have special characters, then you can drill down there. So, the, so this validity, this pattern analysis is very, very important. And it could almost point out anomalous behavior straight away, right? For numerical as well, dates as well. I mean, so, so that, that's really important piece. And we also put that in a visualization and we allow, um, we allow the users some flexibility to be able to um, drill down on that as well. And to be able to also um, flag anomalous behavior for the next kind of, for the next run so that the, 
um, the data profile learns. Uh, the third piece is the distribution of values, which again, this is all standard stuff. The, the, the special source is how you visualize it and involve the user in the output of that data through the visualization and allow them to play with it. So the distribution of values, as, as you all probably know, is the, the, for each attribute, what are the, what are the, what's the, dist, what, what are the, the precedence of values? Um, and then, uh, you know, again, you know, th that can be sorted. It can be um, manipulated so that you can identify v values that potentially could be also anomalous. So for example, distribution of values for a date field, you might see dates in the past, um, distribution of significant amount of values of dates in the past. Now for, for an investment, for certain types of investments, that is probably not a good thing. Um, for certain other types of investments that are you know, dated, rolling day over day, maybe it is, I don't know. You know, depending on the data, but a user would be able to understand that or a data steward very quickly to say, oh, wait a minute, this is a, a loan. I can't have a maturity date in the past. Um, if I do, we have a problem with this. Um, and so all doing all of this, you need the ability, the user needs the ability to feed, feed information back based on what they're looking at so that the data profile um, gets smarter and smarter every time it runs. Also, at each set, uh, section of the dimensionality, the completeness, pattern analysis, and distribution, we have a set of 50 or so preloaded data, standard data quality rules that can be added to the data quality profile tool to be run immediately as they're added as rules metadata to the data profile. Um, and most data profile tools have the ability to support this. So um, if I wanted to add a uh, a, a, you know, a certain completeness rule, or if I wanted to add, let's say, a range, um, I'd be able to do that, right? So we, we, we've preloaded 50 rules, and we, we would also get feedback from the user, hey, there's other simple type of rules that apply for this particular data set. And so we would add them through the data profile, and we would visualize them either through one of these three screens, whether they're completeness rules or pattern analysis or distribution of values, or maybe it's, a, maybe it's another screen that's a customized screen that shows the output of these rules. But again, they'd be pre, predefined rules, drop down box, and the user can click on them. So very simple stuff, right? Um, and then we'll get to the more complicated things in a minute. Um, so, so we're letting the user build data quality rules with immediate turnaround with almost no cost. Um, and then as we get more and more advanced, we also build the ability to filter by making the data profile act as an Excel pivot table. So we build on this. So we allow the user to take, let's say, two attributes and put them side by side and be able to filter. So for example, um, if the user says, for a specific maturity date, I wanna see the distribution of values for products, as an example, right? So let's say the, dis let's say the maturity date um, was one, one of the values was null values in terms of the distribution of values. You can filter on that for any other attribute. In this case, I'm giving you the example of, of products. So for null maturity dates, we want to see all the products that have null maturity dates. And very quickly, somebody that knows the data would say, hey, wait a minute, this, this type of loan, yes, it can have null maturity dates, but this can't. So you, know, you, you see how we're now involving the data stewards, the users of the data, and we're giving them the ability to interact with their data like they never had before. Not just looking at the report, they're interacting with their data. So we then have correlation analysis and we, we teach the user how to interpret the results. So a simple example would be if average daily balance is anomalous, then so probably is the current balance and the statement balance as well. So the user now gets more and more detailed information on their data and, is, and has the ability now to look beyond a specific attribute with the correlation analysis. So now I've taken you on this journey, right? We've looked at all of this stuff. We, we, we've let the user build the rules. Now they're, real, they're really understanding their data. Now they're looking at correlation analysis and they say, okay, the average daily, average daily balance is no good. Let me go back to these other screens and let me look at the statement balance, distribution of values, the validity um, reports, and maybe the, some of the rules that we've run, right? And build additional rules. So we're, we're building upon this. And all the time that we're building upon this, 
the data office is not involved at all because the user is generating all of this themselves very easy through drop downs. Um, so, or I'll give you another example. If the risk weighted assets is anomalous, so is the loss given default, the probability of default, et cetera. So you get, you, you get the general idea. Um, this is another part of the DQ profiling dashboard. So you see that we're building out data quality without heavy DQ development process. That is the, the process of, of DQ, the traditional process is expensive and uh, it's a long time to market. And of course, through these dashboards and the enhanced view of the data, the user might require development of complex data quality rules, which we might need. I'm not saying that we're going to eliminate every single traditional data quality rule, but now the user can, can hone in on the, the complex multi, um, you know, multi CDE or multi attribute. Um, uh, data quality rules that we that we might not be able to satisfy through all of the data profiling um, routines that I've that I've just um, mentioned. So there is still a place for the traditional rules, but they'd be they'd be the exception, not the you know they'd be the exception, and they would be the complex data quality rules that we couldn't implement in this process. But these will be few and far between. We now look at the AI and ML data profiling, and I and I maintain that the correlation analysis and some of this other analysis actually is, um, uh, has somewhat of a machine learning flair to it because we're teaching the data profile what's good and what isn't good. Um, but then we have additional routines. So how do we discover uh, DQ anomalies without running DQ profiling running rules? So we take historical data. So one of the things that we can do is we can take historical data and we run um, a process called statistical process control charts, or those of you that are Six Sigma fans, SPC charts. And they'll identify anomalous behavior based on historical information of the file and or the attributes within the file. Um, and the more transactional history data you feed it, the better the upper and lower control limits, which are the control groups that this comprehends, and the more accurate out of bounds behavior is identified. So I'm going to give you an example. When we when we ran this, not at Scotia Bank in another institution, um, as it learned, it became more and more sensitive to transaction history. And what we discovered was we were missing a whole set of transactions for transaction monitoring. And it was the the set of transaction was minimal. It would not have come out in um, in you know traditional statistics. It was minimal. However, we were missing a whole set of transactions for a, from a particular area for a particular country, which, as you know, even if you miss one transaction in transaction monitoring, you can get fined. Imagine missing 100,000 in this case. Um, but because, because we had run this and we had, we had such good history and we were able to set up very sensitive upper and lower control limits, which the software does, you know, we were able to identify this. Um, and the other type of AI and ML routines is the multivariate regression analysis. I know that sounds very complicated, but it runs and creates a control group and then identifies out of bounds behavior at the attribute level and also comprehends correlation of the attributes that are anomalous. Um, and so a lot, th these, are, these are common routines and these routines can be downloaded from open source libraries and you can even find data profiling open source uh, routines that are also excellent. You don't have to rely on your, you know, your traditional vendors. I mean, there are some routines that are even better than, you know, these big vendors have in, uh, in terms of uh, data profiling. Um, but th these routines are, are really, um, uh, for statistical process control chart and multivariate analysis can be found, you know, again, on open source, just, you know, look for something that's been, that, that has a good history and has, good ratings on it uh, and has a lot of usage. Um, and how do we measure the success of this? So the measure of success, I, I really use two main success criteria. One is, has this process identified issues that we, that we already know, right? So that we can cross check, cross -check our algorithmic, algorithmic approach. So if it's identifying issues that we already know, that's a good thing, right? Because we can, potentially eliminate those rules. And we do know that the, um, the routines are working because you know, we know that these rules that we've, the traditional rules that we've coded uh, are, are, are good rules. So that's one measure of success. The other one is identify issues that have not 
yet been identified and that's key and that's the other measure of success so um so when we tested this we ran this against a very very mature application from a data quality perspective that had thousands of rules and you know hundreds of cdes and so we were able to prove both those points and so both so i explained about the the, the, the standard data profile, which is not really a standard data profile, right? It's and it's an advanced data profile. Um, and I, I explained about the AI and ML routines with the SPC charts and the, you know, multivariate analysis. And the two really are symbiotic. So as the AI, ML, the SPC and the multivariate analysis, as they identify issues, you can drill down using the data profile. I'm going to call it the standard data profiling that I talked about to really drill down and, and, and identify that specific data. Um, so they work hand in hand. Um, and then I think the last thing that I'm going to say is that this is a work in progress. Um, we but we've advanced to the point we, where we know this works. And we're going to adopt this as our uh, future DQ framework. We have, a, we, we have a little bit to go on the AIML front, um, but the visualization piece is, 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 is very well matured and it's uh, ready to, we're ready uh, to implement the phase two of that. And our users um, absolutely love it. The transparency in the data is, is amazing. And the other thing with this process, we can implement hundreds and we can implement this across hundreds and hundreds of files in a, a few weeks. Um, as opposed to running DQ rules, traditional DQ rules, which would take probably years to do across, let's say, 500 sources. I can do this across 500 sources very easily. So, so I guess the, 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 the crescendo here is that I believe through using um, these profiling and advanced AI and ML routines is the future of data quality, easy to implement, very cheap, and allows you to do data quality at scale. So. Uh, I'm going to end my discussion there and I'm going to open it up for um, Q&A. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much, sir. And we certainly do have some questions coming in. So to some of those folks who are just messaging in the chat box as well. Um, so, hey, don't worry, your computer isn't broken. Tom was just having uh, some issues uh, with bandwidth due to a storm in the area. And yes, you can, of course, ask as many questions as you please. We're going to jump into this now. We've got a good solid 20 minutes remaining where we can cover all of your questions so um let's just really start at the very top here so i'm just going to get over open this q a box um first one comes in from mike what are some common pitfalls you would see for just distribution so distribution of the process so i need uh, mike if you can just put in the chat box distribution of you can just confirm if you can hear me mike mike c mike c <clears throat> whilst Mike C is doing that, let me ask another question from Mike C, which was, how do you validate data quality in many cases? So, I, again, I'm going to need a little bit more specifics on Mike. Mike Z is asking good questions, but I need a little bit more clarification. Okay, so first question, what are some common pitfalls you would see okay. for distribution? Yes, distribution of the process. Okay, so, the, okay, so that... So um, I see less pitfalls in the distribution of the process than I, than, than I do distribution of stand, you know, building standardized, uh, standardized DQ rules in the approach. Um, but some of the pitfalls is access to the data. Uh, I think the data profiling routines are pretty well, are pretty well set. And so you need a place to run this. So, you, you, you know, the, some of the pitfalls are, um, of course, you know, I'm going to put aside the provisioning and, you know, sensitive data and all of, the, all of that, right? Um, but, you know, having a place, you know, having a, a, a landing area to run all of this stuff because it's easier to do, um, it's easier to do um, if the data is in one place, you know, if it comes into one landing, landing area. However, um, however, it, you can take these routines and run them in different landing areas against different sources because what I didn't mention, and I apologize, is all of the results get loaded into a common um, reporting warehouse or you know reporting mart that has a very very simple meta model as i mentioned before that has the results of the data profile in it so 
Um, you could federate it out. You could run it in a central area. So um, uh, I, I, I think more, more, the more pitfalls would be the uh, access control and the um, of sensitive data, I think. Okay, great. Um, Mario asks, how have you handled access to PII data, which I believe is personal information data, um, for the data scientists that require it? Things that don't allow for um, obfuscation or redaction of data points, especially when you're first starting to take a look at a model that applies to security data. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, the, the easy answer is, you know, we, we try to get redacted, we try, if there's, if there's known PII data, we try to get it redacted, right? Um, but then again, don't forget, this is aggregated data, right? So um, where would we have the opportunity to look at PII data in the distribution of values um, for the most part, because the completeness is gonna be at a CDE level, the correlation is at the CDE level. So the only values that you're going to see, the only exposure to PII data would be in the distribution of values. So you could actually put that in the data profile if you knew those attributes that had PII, you could put the obfuscation at that layer in the data profile. Okay, fantastic. Um, question coming in on the chat box really quickly here. So question on um, how many data quality rules can you generate and perform analysis? So I said 50, right? Because I, you know, we came up with standardized 50 data quality rules that, uh, you know, we looked at our whole library and we said, hey, these are the ones that are mostly, the simple ones, first of all, and these are the ones that are mostly executed across uh, our, different data, uh, uh, our, our different data quality and rules implementation um, constructs. So we took those, but I mean, since they run as metadata, there really isn't a limitation. Um, there's just a limitation on the, the, the limitation is really going to be on these complex rules that require that require uh, multiple attributes. So simple, simple is easy. And we think that we have the 50 rules that you that, that you know, any corporation would would run typically because we've, like I said, we've, um, uh, we've harvested them out of what we already have. Um, but I don't see a limitation. Other than I just I see a limitation on running complex rules. You know, if you can't really express them with what you have, it's going to be very difficult to do. Again, multi multi attribute um, uh, rules is going to be a little a little bit more problematic. Okay, great. Um, another question here: How can you evaluate data quality solution vendors using Gartner's criteria? <clears throat> well. I'm, I, I didn't evaluate data quality tools using Gardner's criteria. We're using open source. So, um, so um, I, you know, the typical way I would guess, right? It's, you know, what, what, are you, what are your requirements? What do you need? And I guess picking the upper right-hand quadrant of the, of the Gardner uh, tools. And they pretty much, the, the top six um, companies typically all do the same thing, right? They suck in, excuse my language, they suck in visualization, and they're pretty good at, 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 um, at creating data quality rules and data quality profiling, right? Some have a little bit more elaborate process than others. Some are a little, are tied to their ETL language than others, like I, the IIA, IBM. Um, Ab initio is a very closed loop system. Um, you know, that's really, they're, 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 into, they're in and of themselves. Uh, again, I just wanna mention that I personally, don't care if our company has one data quality tool or a hundred. I, I, I don't think a hundred is good, but I don't care because we take the results of all of that and we put it into the reporting mark. So we're insulated from all, from the data quality tools. So I guess to answer your question is, you know, whatever your requirements are, you know, I, I, I would pick the vendors in the top right and, um, and evaluate based on your criteria, depending on what you need, right? For example, do you need to do data quality on HDFS on the lake? Well, there's not that many vendors that do that, so you're limited, right? Um, if it's on um, Unix, they all do that, right? If it's on some other type of file system, so I guess you have to evaluate based on your criteria. Okay. Um, and just on that note, very quickly, a quick follow up. Uh, uh, another quick question here uh, came in Are you only using open source then? Is that it? We're using 
open source and we're using some traditional um, DQ profiling tools. Like I said, you know, we have a hybrid here. Um, so be, be, and, and we're doing both of those things, like the, you know, expressing those rules and everything across both of them. Um, but we're using open source for the, the AI ML stuff is, uh, you know, the SPC charts and the multivariate analysis we're using open source. For the traditional data quality profiling, we have, we have an open source routine and we have a traditional vendor routine. Can you have rules as effective without a clear view of the data lineage? Well, you need the data lineage to identify the source. So no, right? So I started by saying, you know, we do data quality at, we want to do data quality at source and at target, right? So to figure out the source, you have to have the proper data lineage to figure out the source and the proper data lineage to figure out what target that, you're, that you want to measure at, right? The consumption layer and the, and the origination layer. But absolutely, you need uh, data lineage. Great. Um, Carl asks, as we talk about data quality, you can't help but think about the size and growth of the data that is being collected. How can we control the consumption of data from so many solutions? How can we control the consumption of data from so many solutions? Get so many, so, I, I, again, I'm, I'm not, I need to qualify. I would assume, again, Carl, if you're able to, to just kind of like elaborate a little further on the chat, but I would assume with so many different tools out there to capture that data, in so many different ways, how can we control the uh, the consumption to remain quality? I suppose, to a certain extent. Is that is that the question? We'll we'll see if uh, if okay. Carl can elaborate a little bit further. In the meantime, um, in machine learning, models and data quality are intrinsically linked through the use of training data. Algorithms may be viewed as a kind of scientific experiment. If the wrong data is selected, then the experiment can fail to produce an adequate result. What's your take on human intelligence over artificial intelligence? So he's absolutely, or he or she is absolutely right. And that's why we look at as much historical data as possible to build a control group. And, and, and then of course there are human eyes that looks at, you know, reasonableness and we have to pick what the right, you know, what the right historical data is. Um, but in essence, any of these routines, the more historical data, the better the control. This is all, everything is about building a norm, a control group, and an upper and lower control limits, and, and anomalies across that, right? Either one sigma or two sigma, or if you like to use standard deviations, um, anomalies you know, from the control group. So the whole secret sauce to all of these algorithms is, is about you know, what's normal and what's, uh, what's normal, and, they, and, the, and the models predict the norm, they, they, they look at, the um, the data and they predict what the normal what normal is and then they evaluate what's outside of the norm you know and and how far it's outside of the norm it is. Okay, I want to piggyback on one of the questions asked earlier about um, kind of like vendors and solution providers in this space. Now, um, obviously, we know that um, of course you know solutions providers like to create a lot of noise. Um, you know, when the big data boom started, there was all this talk about big data. A lot of people didn't even know what big data was, but they started buying technology because they were like, hey, we need to do it. Um, artificial intelligence to me has a similar type of situation where there's clearly a race to start implementing emerging tech in this space, but there's clearly a massive lack of understanding from a lot of the key stakeholders on how to effectively adopt and implement and use. So when it comes to embarking on a journey with the use of machine learning or artificial intelligence, Tom, can I ask like, what are the, the kind of the, uh, the, 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 the building blocks that you need to look at before you start kind of investing large quantities of money? Okay, so I, let, let me go back to um, that. Then I, now I understand the, the previous question. Mm -hmm. So you always need a human to, to be able to um, adjust the model. Right, because the artificial intelligence suggests, but the training piece, a lot of times is human input into that, right? To say, this is this, you know, we know this in, in, in let's say entity resolution, right? When you're trying to build a customer master and we see that, you know, custom, the, 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 the entity resolution and the way to train the model is to say that, you know, no, these, this, this really didn't, this really wasn't, the same customer this really was different customers or this type of pattern really isn't this type of pattern 
you know, really isn't the right pattern. So you, I think that there is a, not I think, there is, and I mentioned that, that in our solution here, there's always human input to say, well, wait a minute, this is okay and this is not okay. And then the model learns and, you know, it runs again. So there's always a human component to the model. Okay, cool. Um, Carl has able to, to elaborate a little bit further on his question about data quality. So again, just to reiterate, as we talk about data quality, I can't help but think about the size and growth of the data that's being collected. So how can we control the consumption of data from so many solutions? He elaborates further by saying, our data is growing so quickly, we can't keep up with what we are consuming. Do you have any thoughts around keeping the size of the data we are consuming? We pull data from so many different sources. Well, I guess that comes to a prioritization, right? So if you, if you go backwards and what your most critical business processes are and, 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 and what they consume, I mean, you have to scope it somewhere. You can't do this across the whole continuum, right? You have to scope it somewhere. And it, you know, the way we scope it is what's critical and typically what's critical, you, you, the, the, the first sense to that is what's regulatory report. So you set your own standards on what, what, what critical is, but that has to define the scope. You can't, you know, there's not an infinite amount of resources to do this across the board. What I'm saying is that this is, you can do this a lot faster and a lot more cost effective than writing traditional DQ rules and you're gonna yield a lot more. Probably, I don't know what the factor is, but 100 to one or something like that. But I get I get it that data's, data's growing, but you know, we're not gonna run DQ on every single piece of data that we ingest into the lake. That would be, that would be crazy. Um, and I don't even know what you would do with it, right? Because if you, if, if you identify 10,000 things, who's gonna fix them? So you also have to be cognizant of you know risk reward and, and you know you have to you have to put a you have to put a, a, a risk what do you you know what what are you willing to accept as a risk and um and you know you can't look at all the data right so you risk accept certain things and then you uh, based on your you know your risk tolerance it, you uh you you run your routines on the on that data that poses the most um that has the highest level of risk okay carl hopefully that uh helped you with your question there. A uh, question coming in from Monty, is the control group output coming about at a faster pace due to more efficient engines and otherwise barring improvements in Moore's hardware graph? So again, is the control group output coming at about at a faster pace due to more efficient engines and otherwise barring improvements in Moore's hardware graphs? Um, I, I mean, I don't really care about the faster pace of the control group, right? If it takes, I, I, we're looking at data. Don't forget, we're looking at data at rest, not data in motion. That's another uh, maybe discussion for the next month um, because that's a whole nother discussion, data in motion, right? How to, how, how, to, how to measure data in motion, but data at risk. So why do I care if it takes 20 hours versus 40 hours, right? I, you know, you know, again, we're, we're dealing with historical data. Um, and even if we identify things a day later than we should, then, then we, we could have because of so much data, I, I, I don't, I don't know where it really affects the, you know, the outcome, you're still identifying something after the fact. And, you know, mostly you're trying to identify thematic things, not so much incident, uh, not so much incidents, but issues. So I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Um, and we do have time for, for one more just before we kind of close out. And, and one thing I'd love to do is um, at the time of year where everyone's talking about predictions for next year, etc. I mean, where do you see kind of um, a lot of the key challenges being experienced for financial institutions across 2021, specifically pertaining to machine learning, artificial intelligence, and of course, data quality? So, I mean, the machine learning and artificial intelligence has traditionally been used for analytics, right? Purposes, and, uh, and, and I believe that um, what we're going to be seeing is more of that technology being used for traditional work, like what I've just finished speaking about, which is, you know, data quality work. Um, and potentially other types of things. So going into the mainstream as opposed to just this boutique, um, trying to figure out what the next best product is to learn. So we wanna take that 
th th those types of routines and build them into our BAU processes. So that's where I kind of see this going. Awesome. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much, Tom. Really appreciate your insights today. And again, your candidness. It's always fantastic when we can have someone just speak very openly and honestly about their experiences on a specific topic, share their knowledge on a specific topic, and then obviously answer the questions that are burning in everyone's brains as they try and tackle this and prep for what's around the corner. So thank you very much. If the audience would obviously join me in a bit of a virtual round of applause for Tom for taking the time today to share his thoughts again. Folks.